Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ICSA Zoom seminar. We're really grateful to have Professor Sean Anthony with us today. I'd like to use this opportunity just to encourage everyone to be fully involved in the International Quranic Studies Association. If you're not a member, consider joining. You find all the information at the ICSA web webpage. And um, otherwise, my task is to introduce Professor Anthony. He is Associate Professor of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at the Ohio State University and author of The Caliph and the Heretic, Ibn Saba, and the Origins of Shiism, also of Crucifixion and Death as Spectacle, Umayyad Crucifixion in its Late Antique Context. And as many of you know, he is also the editor and translator of the very important work um, of Mamar Ibn Rushd, his Expeditions, which was published with the Library of Arabic Literature. If I started mentioning, mentioning also his other publications, including his articles, um, all of his time would be, would be uh, used up. So let me avoid that and rather introduce um, Sean, who will be speaking to us today on the surprising Christology of the Annunciation scene in Quran, Maryam, Surah 19, verses 16 to 21. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, very much, especially for the, uh, the invitation and a chance to share uh, this kind of research in progress with everybody. Um, I just want to say this is something that I've been just gathering notes on and uh, kind of cobbling together uh, for a while, kind of casually. And so when you sent me the invitation, I thought I'd take the opportunity to give it a little bit more shape. It's still very much a work in process, but I thought it'd be a good thing to use for a seminar because we can go through together and see uh, the way at least I like to work through a text uh, when something interests me from the Quran, kind of the different approaches that I take. Um, it's not the only way of doing it, uh, but I think that uh, it sheds considerable light on the history of the text and particularly on what it may have meant uh, in kind of its earliest kind of reception. Um, any case, that being said, I'll go ahead and proceed. Before I do proceed, uh, I just want to say I, I have a new book out that was just published last month. Uh, I, if you want to buy it, I'd be very, very happy. You can get it at Amazon or UC Press or, or whatever. Uh, it's not on the topic we'll be talking about today. It's more my ideas about the Sira literature and the historical Muhammad. Uh, but there, there is that. All right. Anyway, so let's get down to business. Um, so one of the things that I want to start off with is when discussing this, the sort of the sort of, of Miriam, the 19th sort of the Quran, there's a very large literature that has kind of amassed in recent years, and there's no way that we could possibly hope to review it um, in the course of this kind of short seminar. So what I thought I would do is just begin by giving uh, everyone here, kind of a list of what I think are probably some of the more notable studies that have been written on uh, Miriam as, as a surah and given kind of historical and literary analyses of it in the last 10 years. Um, and so the four works that I, I really uh, set aside as important and, and worth reading and worth your time are Hussein Abud's Miriam the Quran, it's very much a Noivertian kind of approach to the surah. Uh, Guillaume Dies, uh, with this article is actually has an English version, which is going to be published soon as well, but you can kind of get the gist of uh, the basic research that, he, that he's kind of put forward in, it, in the French article already. And then, of course, Angelica Neuver, she's writing her kind of Han commentary, or kind of small commentary that she's doing for the Quran that's uh, also coupled with the Corpus Quranicum website uh, that I'd recommend as well. And then especially, uh, I enjoy particularly teaching out of this, but it's also a very kind of close study of the text. It's, uh, it's lexicon, uh, how to render it into English and to uh, interpret it. I write Mr. Ali Shelkat that I was sort of Miriam that he uh, published, but this kind of rhyming English translation that he published for the Journal of Quranic Studies. Anyway, one of the reasons why I mentioned this is because in terms of redaction, in terms of uh, the structure of the surah, it's extremely interesting. Uh, and it's very clear that it has multiple layers to it. And one of the, you know, the, the earliest stratum, I would say is Meccan. That is, I belong to the, the Meccan period of, of Muhammad's uh, uh, prophecy. Uh, and it has a kind of a very discernible structure that is uh, 
prevalent throughout. It's most conspicuous in the use of this in rhyme ia, 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 all throughout. Uh, and the and the kind of the updated parts of the surah, the expansion of the surah that seem to be kind of later additions, not necessarily after the lifetime of Muhammad, but kind of the exegetical updates, uh, have a distinct and uh, end rhyme themselves, either un, in, im, or da, and za, as you see here. Uh, and the rhyme is much less tight. And one of the interesting things about the surah in general is that this iya is unique to this surah uh, out of all the Quran. Uh, so if we kind of think about it in terms of the redaction history of the text, I would regard the iya sections, the ones with the end rhyme iya, as being the earliest kind of the base text and more or less reconstructible. Um, that's not necessarily in totally uh, important to kind of internalize that conclusion for what I'm going to say today. Uh, the only thing I want to emphasize is that the main text that we're going to be talking about and from this sort of the pericope, the main pericope, is the nativity. Okay, so sorry, not the nativity, the, the annunciation. A lot of attention has been given to the nativities, particularly by Dee and, and Shoemaker. I want to look today at the Annunciation. Okay, so let's look at the actual kind of text itself. Um, so the actual text itself is, is relatively itself short. Is relatively short. Um, um, and and sorry, I'm, get, I'm getting a little bit of, uh, of echo here, all right. Um, and basically it goes from 16 to 21. And the Annunciation uh, just basically means, I don't know where this stuff is coming from. Where that black uh, drawing stuff is coming from. Uh, but in any case, basically what um, enunciation means is the, uh, the scene in which the angel Gabriel announces the virgin birth to Mary, the virgin Mary. Okay. Uh, it's a relatively short scene uh, within the Quran, but it's very beautifully constructed, right? And mentioned in the scripture. Miriam, right? This I think immediately this is very interesting with Qurfid Kitabi, right? What is this book? Right. So we always are we already have a sense that we're dealing with kind of scriptural prophecy, in my view here. When she withdrew from her people to an easterly place, she separated herself from her people behind a veil, and we sent her our spirit. This is Ruhana, and he assumed the shape of a man fully formed. So he assumed for her. And the shape of a man fully formed. That word sawi uh, is also used to describe the, uh, the form or the body of Adam. So the idea of him being fully formed as a human being. And then she said, may the merciful protect me from you, leave if you fear God. And he said, and this is where we get to, I think the more, most interesting part. He said, I am merely a messenger from your Lord. He says, and then ana rasulu the Ahabbalaki Olam in Zakiya, right? That I may give you a poor, pure boy. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to be looking at is why is, he, why is the angel say that he's going to give her the boy? So why does he say I may give you rather than he may give you? In any case, let's keep on reading. She said, How shall I have a boy when no man has touched me and I have not been a harlot? And he said, Thus says your Lord, it is easy for me, we shall make him a sign humanity and a mercy from us, and it was a command firmly decreed. Okay, so there's two things that I, I want us to pay the closest attention to. First of all, I want to pay very close attention to uh, this verse right here, uh, where, it's, where the angel Gabriel says, All right. So he said, I'm merely a messenger from your Lord, so I may give you pure, pure boy. There's a lot of interesting things that are going on here uh, in terms of kind of the textual history, exegetical history, and reception history. Uh, but the other thing I want to point out is this kind of interesting statement uh, where the divine voice says, we sent to her our spirit. And so one of the questions many exegetes ask is, who was this spirit? Right. The standard answer, as probably many of you know, is that the spirit is, is Gabriel. Um, that's the most common exegetical approach. Uh, we'll get to the end at a different one uh, that might be available for us as we go forward. 
any case, when I get a text like this, uh, and I look at it, one of the first questions I, I want to ask is, how stable is the text? Okay, so it, anything to do with the Quran is extremely well attested. Uh, it's a very stable text in terms of its transmission. Uh, but there are always interesting details that are worth checking out. And one of the first places to look is to go to the Qira'at literature. All right. So we have both the strange kind of outlier readings of the Quran, uh, and then we have the, the canonized seven that are considered to be you know, part of the textus receptus uh, as uh, you know, acceptable to be recited in ritual and things like that by Muslims around the world. And what we find is that there's a very interesting reading of, uh, or, or difference in reading uh, between the seven readers of this verse 19, all right, in the 19th surah. So most readings is the one we had in, uh, in the previous slide translation have the ahaba. So the angel says, I shall give. And I said, this is, and I, as I noted before, it's a little bit strange. Why is the angel saying that he's going to give her a child? It seems that it should be God. Well, it seems that other readers agreed. Uh, most famously, Abu Amr, from, uh, representing the Boston reading, he read instead, So I'm a messenger sent from your Lord so that he may give you a child. So this kind of solves a theological problem. The other uh, attestation to this kind of changing of the verb is from Walsh. Um, also, Qalun is, is listed here uh, as the Ahaba. This is also, it should be noted, uh, one of the, uh, the transmissions of Qalun from Nafi'a, this is the Medinan reading, also has the Yahaba, that's from Haluani. So in any case, we have this minority reading of the Yahaba. Okay. And it's interesting, just as a kind of a side note about it, it uh, when you're dealing with uh, particularly the reading traditions of Warsh, as we see present in Mus'hafs and Tafsir works and just written works in general uh, from the kind of Western part of the Islamic world, where Warsh tends to be pr predominant, it creates a lot of conundrums for uh, modern editors of tafsir works. And I wanted to just kind of give you two examples of uh, two important tafsirs uh, taken from the Western Islamic world that were edited and how one editor did a very poor job of, of editing the text uh, because of the kind of sensitivity with changing the constantal skeleton of the Quran here. And one of them did a good job, okay? Uh, so this is a bad job. So this is a tahsil of Ahmad Dawi, who died in 1048. We can see this text, he says, and uh, God's decree, the Ahaba lahi hulaman zakiyan. There are those who read, the Ahaba lahi, fa'al ma'ana, the Ahaba lahi bi amri lahi. So I'm going to give you uh, this boy by God's command. And then there are those who read, the Ahaba lahi, fa'al ma'ana, the Ahaba lahi. So Wait a minute, what's, that doesn't even make any sense here, right? And then we get the next line, where you Jews and you're going to the Ahaba. So he keeps the same Mus'haf reading. He keeps awesome, right, throughout. When clearly the original Tafsir is changing the, uh, the constantal uh, uh, text here in order to accommodate. So I'll show you a good example of a text uh, edited, Tafsir text edited from, from the West. Uh, and this was done for Naki ibn Abi Talib's al hadayya all right? So here we see the same verse, right? We have a, a, a Warsh Quran given us the text. And so even though it has the constant li ahaba, right? The editor puts a note, three, and says, and notes that the, the manuscript actually has li ahaba. And this is mostly what we find in, in uh, Qurans that are copied before print uh, that, that kind of represent the, uh, the reading of Abu Amr and Warsh as well. You can find it really quite widespread if you, if you look, look for it in text. In case, that's just an aside. So the other question I would like to ask is, so we have it attested in the Qira'at literature that there is a, uh, a difference in, in 1919. What did the manuscripts say? Well, of course, there's a lot of manuscripts. So I thought uh, to be brief, we would just look at the Hijazi ones. Uh, thankfully, we have four Hijazi 
type uh, Quran manuscripts for this text. And I say Hijazi, what I'm talking about is paleographically the earliest attested stratum of Arabic texts, basically Arabic writing uh, that we have for the Quran. So these are texts that very likely date to um, the eight, sorry, the seventh century, okay? So if we look at Marcel 19 and St. Petersburg, we have what we would expect for so-called Uthman al-Qurasim. We have the Alaf li Ahaba. If we look at R119 from Haida 1, we have the Ahaba as well. Uh, but then we get uh, two differences. One of them in the famous kind of British Library manuscript, uh, British Library Orient 2165 in London. Instead of having the Aleph, we have uh, kind of a constant skeleton that seems to accommodate the reading of, of Amr and, uh, and Warsh, right? So the Yahada, okay? And we can look at it closer here in a second. And then the most uh, interesting one that we'll get to here in a second seems to have something else as well. The Yahada, that's the palimpsest, the undertext. And anyway, let's take rather a look though first at the British Library text. Here's the, the Yahada, okay? Make it a little bit bigger. You can see it very clearly written. Right there. Okay. Uh, the, I mentioned the undertext of the Sena Palimpsest, perhaps our oldest copy of the Quran, uh, as very interesting reading this text as well. So you have to look at this part of the text. This is the undertext made possible by UV light. And here is our nice little word set. So we have what looks like perhaps the Yahaba Laki, like in the British uh, Library and Manuscript of the Quran. Uh, but then we have what seems to be covered up a tiny dot. All right, so, or a diacritical point. But just like we have a diacritical point here for the Ba, we might have a diacritical point for the Noon as well. And so here we'd have the divine voice speaking, the Mahaba, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so Bahnam uh, Sadaqi and Musan Gurdarzi, they noticed this, they suggested that this is, this is most likely the correct reading, but because of where the diacritic point is situated, um, it might be a, a smudge. Uh, but regardless, what is unambiguous is that you do have the kind of constantal skeleton that accommodates the reading of, of yeah. Okay. By the way, that, the Nahaba is otherwise unattested in the Quran literature. Okay, so that's some of the interesting things that we learn about the stability of the text. The other things that I like to do, particularly when we have uh, biblical stories, is look at what I would call intertext. And so intertexts are of many sorts. Uh, mostly we think of text as in things that are actually written down in books and, and stuff like that. Uh, but kind of accompanying these inner texts is something I, I would like you to pay attention to as well on my slides are a lot of the material remains and artistic uh, representations of the enunciation scene that we get from kind of late antiquity. Uh, we're going to look at three types of inner text. Uh, really Quranic Arabian and then what I call kind of late antique intertext. We'll start with the late antique intertext. Um, and the most obvious intertext for the enunciation scene in, in Miriam is of course the Lucan enunciation scene. So there's only one enunciation scene in the entirety of the canonical New Testament and that's in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we have sort of elements that are very familiar from the Quran. We also have far more uh, details and we get in the Quranic account. Uh, but we have this coming of Gabriel, we have uh, the virginity of Mary, we have mentions of the house of David, of Joseph, these things are absent. Uh, but one of the major echoes of the Lucan account that you do find in the Quran is this inquiry of Mary when she receives the word from the angel where she says, how can this be? Okay, so this is the, the Anayakun, right? Uh, aspect of the Quran. This is kind of a very kind of direct echo, right? This is, the Quran is very clearly engaged with this text. Um, so one of the reasons why I give you this picture here, it's very nice, is 
This is a pilgrim's ampulla, so it's, it's the typical type of kind of water carrier uh, that you would get, uh, that a pilgrim would take after, say, visiting Jerusalem or a holy site or whatever. And we see here this nice early portrayal of the Annunciation scene, right? Here is the Virgin Annunciant, right? So she's receiving the, uh, the announcement of the angel Gabriel. And then we have this nice kind of text from Luke 128 around the edge here. Okay, so we have the biblical intertext. Those are important. Um, one of the things I also think are important is, is looking at uh, the motifs that we see appearing in the Quran and asking why do they appear in the first place? Why do the motifs that appear uh, in, in the Quranic Annunciation scene, uh, why are they there? What are they doing? And how can we kind of interweave our view of this Quranic text historically with how the Annunciation scene was being retold uh, in a variety of contexts and sort of the epistemic fabric of the religious life of late antiquity, right? Um, so one of the most obvious places to look for for this is the homiletic literature and the hymns of uh, the Syriac tradition, particularly because we're dealing with a Christian story here. And what we find is a lot of the things that are mentioned in the Quran have interesting echoes in texts that are made for preachings in, uh, in Syriac and also uh, in retellings of the Annunciation scene in Syriac literature. So I'm just going to give you two examples. There's a lot more uh, that we could talk about, uh, but just for brevity's sake, uh, one of these themes that you get, and you get these in multiple sources in the Syriac literature, is the idea of Mary being in a house of God or being away from her people behind a veil. This usually comes from the Proto-Evangelium of James, but also just appears in the homiletic literature everywhere. Uh, and then Gabriel coming to her, but, but it's interesting that when the angel comes or kind of the divine visitor comes in the Quranic account, he appears to Mary in the form of a fully formed man, right? And so this is a common theme we get in the homiletic literature as well, uh, that Gabriel appeared to her in the form of an old man. And so you get two interesting kind of variations on this theme. And, uh, for example, the gospel is uh, the pseudo infancy gospel of Matthew, or the infancy gospel of pseudo Matthew, I think it is, I can't remember how you say it. Uh, the angel that appears before uh, Mary, or the angel giver, actually appears as a young man. Uh, but here's a venerable old man, and the idea is so that she won't be terrified, right? Um, and then we have another kind of interesting one. This is a uh, a sermon that is attributed to uh, St. Ephraim of, Sy of the Syrian, probably actually not by him, uh, but we have him reiterating the story. He look upon Miriam, my beloved, how when Gabriel entered to her, she spoke with him words of inquiry. How shall the thing be? Right? This is the Luke and Echo, same type of echo that we get uh, with, uh, uh, with the Quran. And the minister of the spirit uh, gave reply to Miriam and said, it is easy for God all things are simple for him, right? So this is very um, similar to our Quranic verse right here, where Gabriel replies, thus says your Lord, it is easy for me, right? we shall make him a sign to humanity and mercy from us, right? So we, we basically see a compatibility of homiletic themes appearing in the Quran. We're, we're participating in this kind of common discourse just a couple of quick words about these rings. One of the reason why I picked up these uh, rings and I want to show them is one, because they have these really great uh, pictures of the Virgin Annunciate on them and the Annunciation scene and, and narratives from the life of Jesus and things like that. Um, but mostly they're usually called marriage rings. And objects and artifacts like this are very mobile. And I think that's one of the reasons why they, they fascinate me. And they kind of, they also... Um, you know, make you ask questions about, well, what is this picture about? And then people tell stories about them. And it reminds me recently of another text that I've been, uh, that I've been uh, editing and, and going through, where we have this kind of list of the, of the khawatim al-sahaba, or the, uh, the signet rings of the companions of the prophet. 
and how a lot of them had images on them. And this, these rings just kind of reminded me of that, kind of the, the way in which stories are very kind of mobile on objects and through art and not just through text. Okay, and then our kind of third Christian intertext that I, would, uh, I wanna uh, look at, and one of them I think is the most interesting, uh, comes from a work called the Epistula Apostolorum. It originates from the second century. Uh, we have it in two languages. Uh, the first of these is, is Coptic. We have it uh, discovered in the Coptic papyrus. The other version is in Ethiopic. And actually this is regarded as, insofar as the whole idea of canonicity is not a dubious concept for the, for the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, it's regarded as part of the New Testament canon by the, Ethiop by the Ethiopic Orthodox Church. And uh, the Epistle Apostolorum basically has this dialogue, a series of dialogues between Jesus and the apostles, okay? And he kind of reveals things to the apostles uh, that are kind of interesting and beyond the, the Old Testament. And what we get in this passage of Epistle Apostolorum is kind of a harmonized version of the Annunciation scene and Luke and the um, narrative of the incarnation that we get in the Gospel of John, all right? So if we look at the text, it had, the resulting kind of theology of it is very fascinating. I think it's very interesting to look at it from the perspective of the Quran as well. So Jesus says, for you know that the angel Gabriel brought the message uh, to Mary. And so the disciples are facing all that. Yeah, yeah, we know this. Then he answered and said, do you not remember that a little while ago I told you, I became an angel among the angels. I became all things and everything. We said to him, yes, yeah, so O Lord. So this is where it starts to get interesting. So what do you mean Jesus became an angel? Then he said, and then, then he answered, he said to us, said to us, on that day, that is, this is the day of the Annunciation, when I took the form of the angel Gabriel, I appeared to Mary and spoke with her. Her heart received me, and she believed. I formed myself and entered into her womb, for I alone was servant to myself with respect to Mary in the appearance of in an appearance of the form of an angel. It's a very interesting idea here. And it gets expanded in other kind of texts, probably most uh, and closest time to the Quran, probably most prominently in the Christian uh, uh, oracles of Sybil, a uh, series of Christian oracles attributed to a, a pagan prophetess called Sybil. Um, in any case, in, in this view of things, actually, is actually very similar to one of the interpretations of the Annunciation passage of the Quran that we get tested in the Tafsir literature attributed to a companion of the Prophet, Ubay ibn Qab al Ansari, who's of course very famous for his knowledge of the Quran. He was called Sayyid al Qura among the Sahaba, that is the, you know, the chief of lectors or the chief of the Quran readers or something like that. Um, and this is what he says. I remember way back when in the beginning I, I told you, uh, we asked the question, who is the Ruh that God sends to Mary? Well, according to this interpretation of Ubay, at least attributed to Ubay, uh, this spirit was not Gabriel, but rather this spirit was Jesus. He says the spirit, the Ruh of Jesus, was among those spirits uh, from whom, so I should, should say from whom, from whom the covenant and the oath were taken. What is he talking about here? He's talking about in the Quran, the primordial covenant that God takes with humanity as a whole. Right? He says, Alastu bi rabikum, and then we all say, that is, the other the God says to all of us before we're born, our pre incarnate says, He takes us from the loins of Adam, and He says, Am I not your Lord? And we answered, Yes. And so we entered into this kind of covenant with God that gave our history kind of a moral arc that culminates in the day of judgment. But there's also a separate covenant with the prophets of their own, right? The prophets have a, take a covenant that they will serve as His messengers. And so Jesus kind of pre existed in this sense, um, as a spirit, as a ruh, like all of us, uh, in order for him to take this kind of primordial prehistoric oath that all human beings took and that an additional oath that prophets in particular took. This is very Quranic stuff. This is all in Araf and Ahzab. Anyway, so Obey says it was that spirit, that pre-incarnate version of Jesus that was sent to Mary. She conceived of the very one who spoke to her, the spirit of Jesus. 
All right. And so the main kind of authority here, this bastard in the in the dying and Mar from the east, he he asks, he says someone, he asks Muqatada bin Hayyan, he's like, well, how did the spirit enter? Right. And he recounted on the authority of Abu Aliyah from Ubay bin Qab that it entered via her mouth. Okay. So that's how he kind of went into the to Mary's womb. This is a little bit different, but somewhat similar to the late antique Christian belief that uh, Mary conceived of Jesus through her ear. That is, she heard the word of the angel, and the word of the angel went inside her ear, and that's how she eventually conceived of a child, right? Okay, so all these texts, I think, give us interesting perspectives on the Annunciation scene. Uh, no conclusions yet. Other thing that I think is important to look at is uh, the Quranic parallels. So we compare, when we have the luxury of comparing an account within the Quran with another uh, account in the Quran, they have to be seen as intertext as well. And I think one of the reasons why this is important is because we, we get into this idea of whether or not we can um, Posit any chronology or chronological arc to uh, arc to the uh, contents of the Quran. I think there there is a chronological arc, and one of the ways, and I think which I think that can be established, uh, is by the self-referentiality of the Quran. Right when the Quran is citing itself. Okay, uh, but one of the things that's fascinating about the Annunciation scenes, the two of them is that we only see the, uh, the Medinan version citing the enunciation scene of the Mecca, not vice versa, okay? And one of the reasons why this is fascinating is in the Medinan version of the enunciation scene in Al-Amran, we have angels rather than a single angel making the enunciation, right? Uh, so this is something quite different. Okay, but we do have towards the end of the enunciation scene, almost verbatim uh, citation of the Meccan uh, exchange between Mary and the angel Gabriel. I, more or less, I put in the light green things that are similar, but not exactly the same. I put in the dark green things that are uh, exactly the same, right? And the red represents totally different or contradictory, however you want to posit it. Okay, our last intertext. Uh, when they're available, or we should take Arabian intertext into, into uh, uh, account. So Arabian intertext could be in the form of inscriptions, um, all sorts of things like that. Uh, but in this case, we really don't have that many, at least that I know of. Uh, but what we do have is a very interesting poem attributed to a contemporary of the Prophet Muhammad named Umayyah ibn Abi Salt that uh, lived in, uh, in Ta'if, so right next door to Mecca, uh, and to whom is attributed all sorts of poetry on biblical themes and also on kind of Arabian, Haizq or kind of Arabian uh, uh, history of, of God's providential workings of salvation that cite the, people like Ad and Thamud and things that are unique to the Quran. And one of the questions that is always surrounding this material is whether or not it is genuine, right? Is, are these later texts or are they um, actually from the time which they claim to be? Uh, unfortunately, I think this is a very interesting text for uh, sort of getting at the history of the reception of the Annunciation scene in the Quran but I think it is quite late. Uh, or it, it survived, this poem survives to us really on the thinnest of threads. It only appears in, in, a, in a book to do uh, Al Maqdisi uh, from, the, from the ninth century. And it's only cited very rarely in that same century by grammarians, a single line. Uh, and much of it shows uh, pretty profound influence, not only of the Quran. Uh, itself, the uh, Quranic language, but also the Tafsir literature. And I'll just show you real fast uh, what happens when we kind of highlight everything that seems to be taken either from the Quran, in terms of its language, or from the um, uh, Tafsir literature. Sorry, should be going. Oops, here we go. And this is what you get. 
All right, so everything in kind of the bright line green are words or say or phrases that are almost exactly taken from the Quran word for word. And the things that are in kind of the bright blue highlight are kind of aspects of the poem that are mostly and sometimes exclusively uh, found in the history of the exegesis of the text. Okay. So this is probably, I would call this a, a pseudo intertext, not an actual intertext useful for understanding the Quran per se, as much as understanding its reception history, right? Um, one thing that is interesting, like who gives the, uh, uh, in the poem, who gives Mary the child? It's a bit, um, if we think about uh, Quran 1919 and, and in terms of line eight, it's a bit ambiguous even in, 19, in, in line eight of Umayyah's poem or pseudo Umayyah's poem, I would say. He's coming to give what is asked of you for I, a messenger, here he's called a messenger again or an angel uh, from the merciful uh, who brings you a boy. But so who is, who is basically doing this? Is it the Rasul Ya'tiki the Ibnimi or is it a Rahman Ya'tiki the Ibnimi? It's kind of uh, uh, obscure in my view. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, and I'm gonna say these are kind of the preliminary takeaways I think that, that these types of uh, exercises uh, should leave us with. Uh, the first of these is I think that historical critical readings of the Quran demand reading the text within the epistemic fabric of its era and its environment. However, we want to imagine that to be the case or whatever name we want to assign to that. Uh, to me, I said that's late antiquity, uh, that is Arabia. That doesn't mean that it's illegitimate to read uh, the Quran within the silo of its reception history by the Islamic tradition, uh, but, and that's actually very interesting, but um, do, reading things, I think, uh, more horizontally uh, with inside its, uh, its actual kind of chronological and geographic space yields different results, okay? Uh, but the key thing to understand is the threads of this fabric are by no means self-evident, right? Even uh, though, um, you know, we try to do this, the, what that fabric is, is not, what is, who's writing that? Uh, what that fabric is, is it needs to be itself reconstructed by historical inquiry. That's one of the reasons why we looked at those homilies. That's one of the reasons why we looked at those different kind of uh, re, uh, narrations of the Annunciation event and things like that, is in order to kind of arrive at that epistemic rapid to try to somehow reconstruct it, right? The other thing I, I want to make clear is that source criticism and inter, is to intertextual readings, kind of what etymology is to historical semantics, right? So we're not necessarily talking about the sources that the Quran is copying from or anything like that, right? Uh, just like when we talk about uh, where words come from, we're not talking about, you know, people's copying from one another per se, right? What we really mean is that the meanings of stories like words change over time, all right? And so we know that words come from certain places, right? We know that stories come from certain places and that we know that those stories and those words change over time. But in order to document how those stories and, uh, and those words change over time, we need to do uh, these comparative readings, right? And these comparative reveal kind of distinct processes at each step of the stage and distinct processes that occur at the Quranic stage as well. I mean, one, one of these processes Angelica Norwood calls de-allegorization, right? So you have a lot of details about Mary kind of being separated from her uh, family by hijab, by a veil. This is the, the temple veil, right? Being located in the temple itself and so on and so forth. So those details recur in the Quran, but they are seem to be you know, kind of um, bled out of their allegorical meaning, right? Okay, last thing. Uh, Islamic scriptural traditions of creation, so the, whether it be scribal or performative, uh, by which word, scribal I mean literally the uh, Islamic scriptural tradition of, of writing down the Quran and recording it on parchment sheets, uh, on papyrus, on paper, etc. And performative, which means the kind of the oral uh, recitation of the Quran, the canonization of the acceptable uh, means and, and methods of performing the Quran. And also the tradition of interpretation, exegetical and, theolo and theological, are indispensable to this kind of historical project as a whole, right? So we need to get all of these parts working together. Uh, we don't mention the, uh, 
the Syriac sources, late intake sources, or, or whatever we're, they're appealing to in order to sideline these, but we mentioned them in order to put them all within dialogue with one another to kind of help us uh, see things that otherwise we might not be able to see. Anyway, I'm, I'm done now, so I'm ready for questions if anyone does have them. Terrific, thank you, Sean. Um, unfortunately, you can't hear our applause, but I think you'll see some people virtually applauding and um, <laughs> allow me to express my gratitude for a terrific presentation. Lots of, lots of comments are coming in on the, on the chat there. Um, so if you can stop the share. Perfect, Hello. okay. All right, great. And wonderful. We already have some questions. I have some of my own, but I will let others take it away. So we'll start um, with Ali. Please go ahead and unmute Ali. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm sorry that I, ha I don't have the, the uh, video. Um, um, I, I have a question about this li ahaba, li ahaba, um, interchange. Mm -hmm. Also, we have the evidence in the manuscript. How do you uh, how do you put them in the context of uh, I mean this kind of intertextual context? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one of the main questions that, <laughs> that I'm trying to arrive at, which I really haven't, like I said, this is preliminary preliminary work, so I haven't actually just came down with a hard opinion on them. Uh, one of the main questions I have when I looked at it is, like, well, what is the original reading? Right? So it seems to me at least, that the reading, the Yehaba, is one that was theologically easier, right? And so it was secondary. I think uh, that would be my first reaction. As a matter of fact, if you look at a lot of the Qira'at literature and where there are given reasons why anyone would read the Yehaba, uh, the earliest reason given is in order to make the text conform to what is actually intended. Right. So the implication of the Ahaba means it, like I by God's command or on behalf of God or something like that, rather than me personally give it to you. Um, and then you have some scholars like Abu Abayd that say, no, you cannot do this. This goes completely against the Masahat al Amsar. This goes against the Uthmanic, you know, the codified version of the Quran. Um, and, and so, but, so that's one way of thinking. But the thing is, if you look at our earliest attestations, if this change did happen for theological reasons, it had to have happened at a very, very early stage, right? And the more I've kind of looked at it is, I, I kind of am a little bit like the Islamic tradition itself, comfortable with the ambiguity that both versions coexisted, right? Uh, and that those both versions were, were preserved. Uh, so the, theologically, uh, there's, there's ways to kind of get around both versions, right? But um, the, the, in general, the, the, citation, the citation of the example I gave you from, from Ubey, interestingly enough, um, is rejected, sidelined almost entirely. Like so, Atabari includes, for example, the, that tradition of Ubey, but he, he, he truncates it to where that last statement about Jesus appearing before his own mother is totally taken out, right? You have to find it in other sources. Um, and so his, his story where Jesus is the Ruh, and that kind of makes sense of why he's saying, I'm going to give you a boy because he becomes that boy, etc. That's interesting. But Whenever we have attributions to Ubay's codex, supposedly he's one of the uh, individuals that read Liahaba rather than Liahaba. So we have this conflicting information. I, don't, I know I'm going a little bit uh, down the rabbit hole, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know at this point, to be honest. Okay, thank, thanks, Sean. There's a question in the chat box, but why don't we turn first to uh, Morteza, please? Hi, Professor Sean. Thanks for your lecture. It was great. Just Wondering if we take more seriously the idea of Jesus being the angel who is making Mary to, you know, conceive himself. Mm -hmm. So is there any, so because we have the idea of Jesus as a kind of creator here, because he's creating himself from nothing actually. Is there any chance to connect Jesus to the idea that because Ar-Rahman as an attribute of God in this passage, 
In the other part of Quran, Ar Rahman does not necessarily seem to be a mere attribute of Allah, but seems to be a person kind of being in charge on the day of judgment, something like the idea of Son of Man in the Bible. So do you see that there might be any chance to connect Jesus as creator here to Ar Rahman? as not necessarily the same as Allah, but as a different kind of distinct person, very close to Allah. Because in the same passage, it seems that Maryam says, I make a vow to Ar-Rahman. It is in this passage or some other passage that, you know, and it is really interesting that why Maryam is citing Allah as Ar-Rahman if they are exactly the same person. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit just wondering, I'm not yet sure about anything, just, just as a hypothesis mm -hmm. stuff. Thank you. Cheers, bye. Um, so I think that in what's already happened in the Quran at this point, at least within Surah Amir, we're already to the point that, that we have an identification between Allah and, uh, and Ar-Rahman, right? And I think Ar-Rahman is more of a name than it is an adjective. Like, so Ar-Rahim is describing Ar-Rahman as a name. Um, and it's a divine name that's well attested in South Arabia. So is the idea of... Um, the Messiah, you know, of Ar-Rahman and things like that. So those associations are already attested in uh, South Arabian inscriptions and things like that. But the idea that they're different is, I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think it's Quranic and I don't think that's necessarily going on in this text. And also I wouldn't say that he doesn't, doesn't necessarily create himself uh, if we, if that's the reading that we want to take. We want to take, say, Ubay's reading and say the Ruh is Jesus. He doesn't create himself as much as he incarnates himself. Right. So he goes into the womb and then, you know, he is formed or forms himself, takes the form of a boy or something like that. But I, don't, I don't think that we, we can kind of separate, make a separation between Ar-Rahman and, and Allah. Thank you, Sean. I don't know if you see the chat box there, but we have a question from Shaheen. Um, do, do you see that? So uh, Professor D argues that verses 34 to 40 of sort of medium are an interpolation. And yeah. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, once you get, like we said, this is a nice outline, right? Um, where you have the, the, the interruption of rhyme. So you have Ia, which is like a very difficult rhyme. Uh, and then it's interrupted by um, an easier rhyme. Un, in, im scheme. Right, and then the ia rhyme scheme begins again. Right, we get this a lot in uh, Meccan surahs. Right, so it's very clear that something textually is going on there. And if you take out the easy rhyme scheme, it works just fine. Right, there's 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 nothing that is um, that it does no violence to the coherence of of the text itself. And it's very clear that those, that section is a kind of a polemical address, right? So yeah, I definitely think that the text has different layers and we see that happening all the time. And so, so D has his, his view of it, right? Which would, this is a post-conquest text and that it's, it's, a, it's redacted and it's updated um, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I don't see this, this process of kind of updating, expanding the surahs as being incompatible with say the lifetime of Muhammad or even kind of the liturgical practices of the early community. Um, you know, the Islamic tradition itself has kind of a, a whole list of verses that are interpolated and added and expanded on kind of the early base structure of, of Meccan surahs, right? Um, there's only one verse, I think 57, if, if my memory serves the Muslim traditions as being and that the Muslim tradition mentions being added to, to Miriam, but maybe I'm, I'm missing one too. Um, but you know, that basic idea is not incompatible. Uh, uh, but so you, you tend to get these exegetical expansions onto Meccan, what we call Meccan surahs all the time. Great, I, I have a bunch of questions and I'll restrict myself to one or maybe two. And then I see Elias has a question. Elias, it's okay, I'll insert my question and then turn to you. So um, one I think is a simple one, which is um, you, you have the British Library Manuscript 2165, mm -hmm. Sean, where um, you read it as li mm -hmm. but is, well, there any, yeah. is, it, is it potentially Nahaba in line with, I mean, if that's how you read it this. It very much could be, yeah. Like, I mean, the, because um, the palimpsest has that reading li 
There's, there's yeah. no way, no way to tell. of really excluding that. Yeah. Okay. And then just two details about this Sura 19 um, passage. Um, one is uh, Mary's in an Eastern place. Mm -hmm. So you alluded to in some of the intertexts, the tradition maybe of her being in the temple at the Annunciation. Yeah. I think one of the Syriac texts alluded to that. So do you have thoughts about the Eastern bit, the Sharqiyan in Sura 19? Um, yeah. yeah, I have another question. Let me keep it at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, so I think those are those are the common themes that you get in in the uh, uh, the infancy gospel of pseudo James or the Protean Evangelion of James or whatever. I think that comes from those traditions. Whether it ultimately comes from that text, I don't think so. The, the fact that, for example, she is uh, behind a hijab, right? That she's weaving the temple um, veil or whatever. These are very common homiletic motifs that are associated with. Uh, with Mary before the Annunciation and, and at the Annunciation scene, right? Uh, and the fact that they're there and it's not really clear what they are doing there, I think is a really good signal to what Neuver calls the de-allegorization process that happens in the Quran. I mean, D was mentioned, which I think he has a nice, really nice, brilliant uh, analysis of, of this sort of in general. But one of the things where I think I would disagree with him uh, is if you read a lot of this homiletic literature, uh, where there's like Hagiopolites or Jerusalem homilies and things like that, which we do have some of these, or the stuff from the like, Syriac tradition and things like that. Um, they have, they're ch so chock full of, in, they're much more long-winded. They're, they're, they have many more Christological themes, right? Uh, the divine sonship of Jesus is so prominent, right? The Davidic lineage of Jesus is super prominent. You, you have a number of these tropes that are just constantly in your face, right? They're just reiterated over and over and over. In their absence in the Quranic text is so loud, to me at least, uh, that I, I would say this is the, the Quranic text is, is very different from, say, a homily or, you know, or a Syriac, you know, poem or something like that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Elias, please. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, so um, I have a couple questions. Uh, questions. Uh, one is uh, on the, the your interview. I mean, uh, you're obviously not holding any specific position since, you, as you said, this is from your remarks uh, on the uh, the attribution of the act of uh, Wahhab to the to the angel. I mean, can yeah. this just be like the inzal of the Quran? I mean, uh, it once sometimes it's attributed to the to Jibril nazalahu ruh al qudusi fa Jibril anzalahu nazalahu ala qalma. Sometimes it's attributed to God. Mm -hmm. Can it just be that? And yeah. uh, the 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 second question is yeah. uh, the second question is about the the intertexts. Uh, I find it very interesting that uh, a very very short text, the story of Maryam in the in uh, in this surah, uh, alludes to a large number of other texts. Okay, so what does to to go quick? What does that tell us about this narrative? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the first one. Is so theologically like the Ahaba, can it just be Gabriel? Yeah, I think it's it very clearly that's very possible, right? Uh, usually, this is what most of the Mufassars are actually say. Like, they say what a taqdeer here is that it had the middle law, right? So, the, the implication is that the giving is God's, right? And theologically, that's very easy to do away with. What's interesting though is that just the near shadow of the kind of the doubt that that might not be the correct reading leads to different textual interventions, right? Now, I'm not saying in any way that the Ahaba demands one reading. It clearly didn't. Um, and the thing that, that, I, that I would say is the short text is engaging with a large number of texts. I would like to correct you there. Okay, so um, each of those texts that, uh, that I put up, even, uh, I would say not only the text, but also Kind of a lot of the artifacts that I put up. Remember, I put up with the text also artifacts, little pieces of kind of Christian art that they to say like we don't have a lot, so it's, you know, you do what you can to within say you know two centuries or three centuries of the revelation of the Quran. We don't really have a large number of texts that are being attested. We have a large number of motifs, and so the question that that I'm really answering is, can we find these motifs present in other texts, right? 
So it's not that like, oh, you know, this pseudo, it's not like we, we are imagining, um, you know, that, that, you know, when the Quran is being put together, there is a, you know, there's a library like down the road that has, you know, the uh, the CSCO is that what it is? Is the Corpus Christi one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they're right down the road from them, and they're going, to, oh, here's a good one from Pseudo Ephraim. Here's a, that's not what we're really looking for. We know that there were all sorts of motifs that were used in the retelling and the preaching of the Annunciation scene, right? Both at pilgrimage sites within inside uh, communities and things like that. Um, and the question is, you know, do we find these motifs in other texts too? Right? And so that's really what I'm, what I'm trying to show is that these are motifs that characterize the era. Right? Um, I, I mean, one of, I'll give you a silly example. These, these motifs tend to be geographically and chronologically bound, right? So, like, you know, in, in American Christianity, you always have this idea that you have a friend in Jesus, like Jesus is your best friend, right? And so, like, if you would go back, I don't know, to 7th century Palestine, you would probably have a hard time finding, you know, the, in the homilies, things about Jesus being your, your best buddy and playing basketball with you or something like that, right? So, a lot of these themes and how this story is being retold are, like I said, chronologically bound. And it's interesting to see that these motifs that we see occurring in the Quran occurring in texts that are that are broadly in circulation or at least that are popular right. great i think i'm going to try to get in one more question there's a whole bunch on in the chat box for everyone else that um uh, we won't get to i just encourage you to um to hop on twitter to use the hashtag xzoom you will find sean on twitter as well he has one of the best twitter handles in the world um and so here's a question from John Shinquin who asks, um, maybe you see it there, Sean, though, though there's a lot of um, narrative now. Are there features within Quran 19 and 3 which point to the Quran 19 Annunciation being earlier um, than the Quran 3 account, as you mentioned, traditionally Mecca and Quran 19, without reading both in light of an accepted chronology, right? If you don't have like a nodical chronology before you, could you conclude that 19 is earlier? Um, so the thing that I would say about that, like my answer to that is that if you look at Surah Miriam as it's constructed, right, with its very strict adherence to kind of the, the in rhyme, syllabic count, and things like that, and you compare it to uh, Al Imran that has a much looser composition, actually in terms of in rhyme, if it's much more likely that the kind of verbatim quotes that appear in Al Imran come after their, uh, uh, so the, the verbatim, so we have two, a number of like words that are kind of verbatim with one another, and Al Imran and in Surah Miriam, right? So the, the Miriam Surah is very tightly composed and it has a unique Imran, right? And so when those verbatim quotations appear in a less tightly composed uh, text, it seems likely that that less tightly composed text was quoted in the tightly composed text. You get what I'm saying? There's a, that's one of the, my basic ideas. And, and I think also, if you look at the Surah of Al Imran more generally, it has a much more extensive and much more complicated, uh, um, much more kind of theologically robust prophetology, a view of like the history of prophecy, who prophets are, and what the role of the messenger is in his community. To me, that's, that begins, that comes chronologically later, right? You go from simple to more complex. That's the more other argument. Great. Thank you, Sean. I just have three final tasks um, uh, to, to accomplish here. First is to encourage everyone, if you'd like to find a way of expressing your gratitude to Professor Anthony, to um, buy his book, Muhammad and the Empires of Faith, or maybe ask your library to buy the book. And then second is to announce that um, next week we'll be here again. So we look forward to seeing you. Professor Ahmed Dejaler will be speaking on pre-Islamic Arabic inscriptions and Quranic orthographies. And then the third is just um, to ask you to join with me in um, thanking Sean for that great presentation. So thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.